Welcome back. We have arrived at the planet Onius 2, where a mysterious distress signal originated. According to Spock, there are only two life forms on the planet. And there is apparently this structure which seems to be the origin of the signal. Let's take a look around, shall we? The building, which is old and pitted with micrometeorite strikes, appears ancient, and if built by humanoids, was created for tall individuals. I guess that door is quite big. The doorway is unobstructed and appears normal except that it is taller and slightly more narrow than a terrestrial doorway. A natural tower of rocks, apparently volcanic. The dry, dusty red dirt cakes your boots in a thin patina that will be difficult to brush off. Great. The bright yellow bowl of the sky is unremarkable, except in that you see absolutely no clouds or flying creatures at all. Yeah, it seems quite desolate. James T. Kirk, as always, appears fit, alert, and ready for the challenges of the universe. Spock frowns slightly as if distracted by your scrutiny. Ensign Johns looks around nervously and mutters under his breath. Oh great, can we just have a, a you know, a competent crewman with us? Be nice. Dr. Leonard McCoy appears uneasy on this inhospitable world. A magnificent desolation. It reminds me of a summer I spent on Mars climbing Olympus Mons. You're kidding, right? Somehow I don't think so. Also, I don't really think there's anything magnificent about this particular desolation, but still. It strikes me as unlikely, Captain that this world is capable of sustaining the society and culture needed to generate the distress signals we have been receiving from here. That does seem weird. I mean, technically, I guess this is Class M, but it seems to be very barely so. Forgive me for saying so, sir, but this place is pitiful. Yeah, I wouldn't take a vacation here. Well, I think I've finally found something I dislike more than having my molecules scrambled this world. Bones, stop complaining. There's nothing wrong with this place aside from a little dust. I guess so? As improbable as it might seem, I'm getting multiple life form readings from inside this building. That does seem very improbable. But then again, somebody has to have built this, right? Wonder if they're still around? My readings indicate that a force field was here until very recently. Interesting. I wonder why it was dropped. The ozone layer is sufficient to allow the world to support life. But the lack of water vapor in the atmosphere makes survival marginal at best. The vast majority of the water on this world is trapped within the rocks beneath the ground. It is unlikely that it could be harvested commercially because of the amount of energy it would take to free it. The world is quite normal, though the rocks are rather sparse in silicates. The planet is habitable, but unsuitable for colonization. That seems to be a fair assessment. A form of granite, Captain. Primarily composed of potash feldspar. Okay, I'm not very interesting. I tell you, Jim, if I could get my operating room as sterile as this planet, I'd be overjoyed. Huh. Well, it's certainly not organic. The only organisms that register on my tricorder are us, or in that building. Okay, so nothing's alive except for in the building. Before we check that out, I actually want to look around outside first. Actually, no, I don't. I don't actually want to look around outside first. This mission, in my opinion, makes more sense. An antenna. I wonder what it was meant for. That's what we're here to find out, Mr. Johns. Like, this mission makes more sense, in my opinion, if you do the inside part first, because then you know why you're doing what you're doing out here. 
But when I try to do it that way, I could not get the full score. It seems you have to do this first. And now that I've said that, I'm fairly sure somebody in the comments is going to point out that they managed to do it the opposite order and did get full score. I tried it like five times with different things. And I just could not get it to work. So we're doing this first. This antenna is quite interesting though. Maybe that's the source of our distress signal. This seems pointless. Stars twinkle just a bit through the thin atmosphere. Really? Even though it seems to be daylight out? You'd think that that would drown them out. Volcanic in origin, these rocks have been here for a long time. Volcanic and Unlike the rocks surrounding it, the sensor array dish looks fairly new. It does look uh, pretty recent. The control mechanism for the array. Wonder if we need to do anything with that. This seems point. James T. Kirk squints against the harsh sunlight on the surface of this world. Ensign Johns appears bored by the desolate surroundings. Well, excuse me for not uh, being more interesting of a mission. Sorry. Dr. Leonard McCoy rubs at his eyes as a little dust blows up. Yeah, I bet that's horrible uh, out here. Spock looks around, apparently at ease in these surroundings. I guess it is a little bit similar of what we've seen of planet Vulcan. Not quite a picnic spot, but it has its charm. What do you think, Dalton? With the thin atmosphere, sunblock 187 would be nice. True. I hope they didn't pay the landscapers very many credits for this work. You know, Jim, this is not the kind of place to inspire homesickness. Aside from this sensor array, there is nothing unexpected here. Well, the sensor array is quite unexpected, so we should probably scan that. The array appears to have deployed recently, which explains its lack of damage. The focal point of the dish is aligned approximately 35 degrees above the horizon. That does not tell us whether or not the uh, distress signal came from here. This appears to be similar to Federation technology, Captain. Its control principles are similar to the Madai sensor dish on Vulcan. It has locked the array at a 35 degree angle. Without knowledge of the code control sequence, I cannot adjust it. I also detect that its power core is not functioning. It operates on geothermal energy, tapping into heat from the ground below. Indeed, it appears to not have power. Captain, until power has been returned to these controls, there is nothing I can do. Aside from this sensor array, there is nothing unexpected here. They don't really give you any hints about how you're expected to generate uh, power, other than that it is geothermal. Although you kind of get hints when you do a little bit more scanning around here. These rocks are approximately 1.3 billion years old and are volcanic in origin. Not that, though. Nothing unusual about the... This appears to be the most accessible spot to heat the rocks below the ground and generate geothermal energy for the array. Yeah, so you're supposed to heat the rocks. That is not mentioned anywhere else, as far as I can tell. It is only mentioned if you scan them. Captain, although this rock formation does indirectly lead to the thermal core, I suggest finding an area that would allow a more direct transfer of energy. We have found that area. It's this part here. So let's try to heat that up with our phasers. The energy level is insufficient, Captain cannot generate the energy level needed to provide geothermal energy with hand phasers. If it's thermal energy you want, Jim, I remember this planet that used a starship's phasers on a microwave setting 
to heat the surrounding rock to provide temporary power. An interesting observation, Doctor. We could use the same technique here, but the beam would have to be extremely precise. If we targeted the wrong section, we could melt the rock and destroy the array. Yes, so you have to scan this part of the rock before you can attempt that. Don't worry, it won't let you do it. Once you have done that, though, you can contact the ship. Kirk to Enterprise. Sulu, can you read me? Sulu here, Captain. How can I help you? The Enterprise should broadcast a low-level microwave beam at the coordinates I am sending. We have them, Mr. Spock. Get ready. Stand away from the blast area. Stand by, ready for weapons position. Sending microwaves now. Temperature near the power coupling is rising rapidly. I estimate a below ground temperature of 345 degrees Kelvin is required to reactivate the array. It is at 320, 330, 335, 340, 345, 350. Shut off the beam, Mr. Sue. Affirmative, Captain. The array is now drawing power. We were successful. That seems to have done the trick. Let's scan it again. The array is functioning stably. I estimate our discharge has given it adequate energy to function for 13 days, 7 hours, and 26.8 minutes. Alright, anything we can do with the array now that it has power? Captain, the parameters of this sensor have been preset. I suggest we do not change them unnecessarily. That does not appear to be the case. So let's continue looking around. And we find another dish. Still don't know if these are the source of our distress signal though. If they didn't have power, I doubt it. This one does have power, but that's just because we already did that. If we'd gone to the left first, it would not have. This seems pointless. Harsh winds and meteorite strikes have sorely weathered these ancient rocks. The clearing is filled with hard rocks, hot dust, and enough sharp edges to make everyone wary. Harsh winds and meteorite... In sharp contrast to the surrounding stones, the array glitters unblemished by the surroundings. The control mechanism for the array. James T. Kirk runs a strong hand over his smooth chin and studies his surroundings like a general surveying a battlefield. Seems a bit over the top. Dr. Leonard McCoy frowns as sweat forms on his upper lip. Spock ignores you as his restless gaze darts from feature to feature of the landscape. Ensign Johns appears unenthused by the surroundings. Yeah, so much it doesn't, um, so far it doesn't really seem like we have an awful lot of use for a genetics expert. Kind of reminds me of a Klingon penal colony, don't you think? I think I would just as soon avoid the research needed to make that judgment, sir. Well, Kirk will get the chance, but the one here's going to go to, it will be a hell of a lot colder. Someone once tried to talk me into buying a retirement villa on a world like this. It was a bargain. Small wonder then. <laughs> it reminds me of the apartment Shepard can get in the, uh, the DLC for Mass Effect 1, which is also on a similarly um, barren world. Can't think of the name of that DLC. Ring Down the Sky is the other one. Pinnacle Station, that was it. This array is clear evidence of an ongoing alien interest in this world. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's any locals who could have built this. Someone selling ice water here would make a fortune. Well, if you want to leave the Enterprise and set up a shop, I guess you could. Problem is, there's nobody to actually sell to. Maybe those two lifeforms inside will want some. appears to have deployed recently, 
which explains its lack of damage. The support beneath the base is weak and crumbled. It is aligned to a point approximately 35 degrees above the horizon. That's the same as the other one. Captain, the controls indicate the device is aligned at an angle approximately 35 degrees above the horizon. There appears to be some sort of anomaly in the control program that has misaligned the controls, but my tricorder is unable to determine it. Without a method of determining the proper angle, I am afraid I cannot realign the dish. Okay, so we need to realign this dish and we need to find out to what angle. These rocks are approximately 1.3 billion years old. These rocks are... Nothing unusual. Scanning the rocks didn't help with that. Well, if the tricorder isn't able to do it, maybe the Enterprise can? Scotty, I need a calculation from the main computer. While I know the computers on the Enterprise aren't quite as good as her engines, I think she'll manage. I am sending the problem. Ugh, that was too easy, Mr. Spock. The angle is 32.5 degrees. Thank you, Mr. Scott. So is there anything else you need, Captain? Not now, Scotty. Kirk out. All right, looks like we got the correct angle, so Spock, if you please. I am now attempting to realign the device to 32.5 degrees. It should now be correctly aligned. Well, as they say, trust but verify. Captain, the array is now properly aligned to 32.5 degrees. No idea what that accomplished, but uh, I'm sure it was something. I do not need to use the controls. The sensor is properly aligned. All right, moving on. We can go further to the left here. And there is yet another antenna. The sensor array's bright disk blossoms on a rock like a metal flower and points toward the distant horizon. These descriptions are getting kind of poetic. This small computer controls the elevation of the sensor dish. Let's see if we need to adjust this one. The volcanic rocks bear tiny scars from siderite strikes, as very little burns up in the atmosphere here. I guess the atmosphere must be pretty thin, then. The arid terrain is composed of lava rocks big and small. It would seem hospitable to a scorpion, or a Klingon. Too bad there don't seem to be either of those here. Or is that a good thing? James T. Kirk seems not to notice as a little sweat trickles down the side of his face. Spock's gaze darts quickly between features, doubtless cataloging them for a later report. Ensign John's irritated expression suggests frustration or a pebble in his boot. Well, that is the worst thing ever, so... Dr. Leonard McCoy looks around as if desirous of a soft place to sit down. Yeah, good luck trying to find that air. The peacefulness of this planet is a nice change, isn't it, Mr. Spock? Somewhat like the meditation grounds on Vulcan, Captain. After our encounter with the Alasi, the Vardain, and their replica of the Enterprise, I can appreciate a few less stressful missions. True, Captain. As long as you do not lower your guard, there is always the potential for danger. Yeah, so far this just seems to be mysterious. Not as dangerous as dealing with Dr. Burdell or Trelane for that matter. The array appears to be in similar condition to the others we have seen. This is definitely the kind of place you want to be from, not heading to. I'm on McCoy's side here. The difference between this place and hell is flames. You overlook one other difference, Mr. Jones. As your author Mark Twain said, heaven for the climate. Hell for the company. Yeah, all the interesting people are there, I guess. Or would be if it existed. This 
rock is a secondary formation produced by the interaction of plates, earthquakes, and volcanism. And here I was hoping to find out if it was also 1.3 billion years old. I guess we'll never know. The array appears to have deployed recently, which explains its lack of damage. This array appears focused on a point approximately 35 degrees above the horizon. That's the same as the first one, and the second one before we corrected it. This appears to be similar to Federation technology, Captain. Its control principles are similar to the Madai sensor dish on Vulcan. It has locked the array at a 35 degree angle. Without knowledge of the code control sequence, I cannot adjust it. But it seems that like the first one, we cannot adjust this one. It is locked in place. Um, I think you actually get a funny message if you try to use Kirk on the mountains. All these rocks make me think about someday getting back into the sport of rock climbing. Anyone else interested in trying it? I see no logic in such an activity. I pass. I'm not a mountain goat, Jim. So much for the spirit of adventure. Well, we know he ends up free climbing El Capitan. And nearly dying doing it. So maybe that's um, as good of a reason not to get into rock climbing as any. Anyway, we couldn't go any further, so let's head back to the building and actually go inside this time. Well, I have to hand it to whoever built this place. All this equipment looks brand new and in good repair. Let's hope the Enterprise looks this good when it's this old. We should be very careful about how we proceed, Captain. I have a strange feeling that evil is lurking nearby. Evil, Ensign? Something that wants to imperil our souls, sir. We must avoid that at all costs. Yeah, sure. This place is kind of weird, clearly not built by inhabitants of this world. A large dry room. The huge ancient stones remind you of the buildings in Machu Picchu, Peru. Whoever built this, built it to last. And it seems they did a pretty good job of that. Aside from minor differences in styling, this looks remarkably like a Tellarite 8000 DNA sequencer. That's interesting. If not for a thin covering of red dust, you would assume this DNA replicator had just been unboxed and set up. If you look at the tanks, it gives you the same description as the controls for the tanks. Except that this one seems to have some green goo on it. This appears to be a patch of rust and dust that has accumulated on the machine's surface. I guess it's just oxidation, not uh, anything organic. Still, if we want to use this at any point, and I'm guessing we need to, that might be in the way. Ensign Johns wears his surprise at the surroundings transparently on his face. James T. Kirk, as always, appears fit, alert, and ready for the challenges of the universe. Spock raises an eyebrow as he surveys the room. Dr. Leonard McCoy smiles as he is confronted with a familiar environment. I guess the DNA sequencer is familiar to him? It's kind of interesting. A door leading to another room. Actually, I was trying to look at the pillar, but sure. A door leading to another room. Interesting equipment we have here. Indeed. I haven't seen equipment like this since I interned on Talara. Such equipment. In such a place. It is weird. You know, a person could do serious research with a device like this. What an odd piece of equipment to find in a place like this. A DNA synthesizer and replicator. 
This is one of the most advanced genetic facilities I have ever seen. How unusual. How so, Spock? Even visitors to this planet would leave behind a substantial number of artifacts. Sending only a genetics lab does not fit established archaeological patterns. Yeah, I wonder why there's nothing else here except for this. It seems almost deliberate. This DNA sequencer appears to be nearly 50,000 years old. Yet it has not broken down and appears to be fully powered. Aside from some dust and dirt, and a small chemical deposit on the intake nozzle, this DNA replicator appears to be in the same condition that it was 50,000 years ago. 50,000 years old? Damn. I don't think any of the equipment I have will be in working condition after that long. Readings indicate that along with oxidation and dust, there is some organic residue in the crust-like buildup. Oh, so there is some organic material, even though before it just looked like dust and rust? I'm just a simple country doctor, not a magician. There are some things I just can't fix. But we still can't actually scan it with a medical tricorder, so no idea what that organic material is. There are life form readings just to the east and west of this room. Not to the north, so that's interesting. Can we use these machines? I guess McCoy would be the right person to try that. This looks like a Tellarite 8000. Do you think Tellarites were here and have duplicated the design? Unlikely, Doctor. But that is an interesting observation. It's fairly simple to operate. You input samples into the sequencer and you can combine with the replicator. Using the replicator is the hard part of the operation. Well, good thing we have a geneticist with us then. But it seems like we need samples first. We also need to do something about that residue, I'm fairly sure. Let's see if maybe our phaser can take care of that. A unique use of a phaser, but adequate for removing the deposits from the apparatus. That worked. The Spock said there's life forms to the east and west, so let's go east first. Greetings, gentle beings, and welcome. I am Azra of the Omegan people. You are the salvation we have long sought. Thank you for answering our summons. An angel! Actually, it is the projected image of an angel, Mr. Johns. Jim, somewhere in that machine behind the portal are single-cell organisms. They have a healthy metabolism and a long lifespan, but an extremely low rate of reproduction. Interesting. A projection of what looks like an angel, and by the sound of it, this was the source of the distress signal. More and more peculiar. A large dry room. The huge ancient stones remind you of the buildings in Machu Picchu, Peru. Whoever built this, built it to last. A large alien computer. The computer console has a conventional keyboard which is covered by odd symbols you do not immediately recognize. The thick glass window and the light coming from it make it difficult to see beyond it, though you get the impression of a living plasma swirling behind it. The golden projection gives you a clear view of a lithe, sprightly figure of great beauty. Compassionate intelligence shines from its wide eyes. I wonder why it looks like that. Probably not a literal angel. James T. Kirk scrutinizes the room his thoughts rushing along at breakneck pace. Spock's face displays no emotions. It never does, so that kind of goes without saying. Dr. Leonard McCoy looks intrigued by this new area to explore. Ensign Johns appears transfixed by the apparition that manifests in this room. So he seems. This reminds me of the first time I saw them cloning Amoslavs at the Academy. It seemed like magic at the time. The fetus is growing into embryos, then developing into infants. Life is a miracle, Captain. Okay. 
This machine is a genetic bank, Captain. I suspect that the projection acts as a fail-safe mechanism that will surrender samples of the genetic code for sequencing and replication when the mechanism is willing. Interesting thought. This device contains genetic soup, Jim. Amino acids, proteins, the stuff of life itself. We need to do everything we can to preserve the lives of these angelic creatures. Even though they seem to be just single-celled life forms, from what McCoy said? This casing is constructed from a uranium alloy and contains computer equipment and image projector controlled from the keyboard, a communications relay, a genetic bank behind that porthole, and a slot with which to take samples from the genetic bank. The computer is quite sophisticated, Captain, with encoded engrams similar to Dr. Daystrom's M5 computer program, which would indicate artificial intelligence. Interesting. The computer is functional, but I detect no connection between the keyboard and the machine itself. Apparently, it was designed this way. It's not very useful then. Energy levels behind this glass are more than sufficient for having powered the distress signal we received. So I guess this is the origin of that signal. This projection is being cycled at 1,000 frames a second, which suggests the equipment was designed to function in the presence of a race that has a sharper visual acuity than the human or Vulcan races. Seems more like five frames per second if you ask me, but... I'm sure that's just an illusion. I'm just a simple country doc. The enclosure behind this porthole is teeming with life. Billions and billions of creatures. There's something wrong with the piece of this genetic code that controls reproduction. I've never seen such a low reproductive rate in an organism that's this simple. That's weird. Whatever he is, he's not alive. I get no readings at all from him. Yeah, I think we'd established that this was a projection, so... Well, I guess we'll try to talk to this projection in the next video.